Hey, hey everyone. I'm Jennifer Seibert and I'm so excited to be here today with all of you to look at the Plano Art Association's member show. It's really beautiful. We'll do a little walk through just in case you can't make it out to see the show. Um, but I'm gonna start um, by talking a little bit about the organization and um, maybe talk about this painting first and it's by John Van Ness, who is the secretary. Um, he's been with the organization for a long time and I think that he would be very pleased if I were to tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, it's been a nonprofit art org since 1969. Um, they have monthly meetings in which they do all kinds of cool different things. They'll do um, visiting critics um, will come in and critique the artist's work. They will have visiting artists do demonstrations and workshops. Um, they do plain air events. They have a Friday night lights and shadows where they paint from the figure. Um, they do mural projects. They are in collaboration with all other arts orgs within the city. Um, and you should check them out because it's just a really great group where you can network and um, see all the cool artwork that's being made in Plano. So let's check out the show. Um, this painting here by John, I think it really kind of sets off what's so cool about Plano Art Association um, because it's just really lovely and embodies so many different things. It has this like really painterly kind of background negative space. Um, that's abstract and gestural um, and has all kinds of movement, but then it incorporates this really beautiful, bold design work with this heavy, dark line. Um, he has a really good handle and understanding on color theory with the cools in the background and then these desaturated warms that sit as the focal point coming up in the picture plane. His understanding of composition is strong where he has this really great static, gridded design in the back, but uses these really lovely diagonals to bring you up through the picture plane. And that's the kind of stuff that you get to look at and learn about when you become a member and um, work with all these other cool artists. So let's go look at the show. So I got a little bit of information this morning um, about who was um, chosen by our juror um, to be the winners for this exhibition. Jerry Smith is the juror this year. He is the owner of um, the Dallas Metro Arts Contemporary in downtown Plano. He's been an arts educator for over 18 years, has been in over 250 shows, has a, a Master of Fine Arts degree from University of Kansas and was a fellow at Skohegan. Um, so we're excited to see what he picked and I'm gonna share them with you. Um, so the awards were separated into categories, representational, um, non-representational, photography, and um, three-dimensional work. So we're gonna start with this first place winner by Keith Miller in the non-representational camp. And I talked to the juror a little bit this morning and what he was saying he really loved about this piece was that while it looked really spontaneous, it also had a sense of control and planning. He responded to that the negative space back behind was the cool color that receded and created a nice sense of depth. Um, and then that it worked in concert with the primary color palette creating that sense of build. He felt that it looked like all of that negative space was controlled, but then that the artist was able to capitalize on this kind of more intuitive, um, process-driven part of the painting. Um, and he loved that the materials really transcended and you weren't actually sure how it was made. Um, and that was his favorite part about it. I really love the movement and how it feels like it has such a kind of sense of um, kind of energy and dancing to it. It's really beautiful. One of the other um, categories was representational art. So he chose this one by Sue Killingsworth. Um, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but I'm gonna just try to talk a little bit about how beautiful the negative space is. It's so beautiful in that it um, probably looks just like a, a 100 black space, but it's filled with blues and violets and lots of really beautiful brush strokes and has this great sense of chiaroscuro with this light out of dark and these figures kind of coming up. And then using these really pretty alizarins and um, warm tones that kind of pull forward. But he mixes those cool red alizarins with some of the kind of more um, 
warm cadmiums as well, which is really beautiful to create that sense of space and um, representational quality while still being a painting. That's what Jerry really liked, that when you get close, you can still see all those beautiful brush strokes with that really gorgeous energy. It's just beautiful. So let's look at some more. So here we have our first place winner in the three-dimensional camp. Um, and due to the space, um, they ended up having the artist bring in a photograph of it. But what we're looking at here is by Christine Miller, and it is like 14 by 10 inches big, so something like this in real life. And the juror told me that he really loved the way that the materials transformed into something else. The title of the piece is Emergence and it's made with metal wire that's woven together. Um, he just thought that it had a real sophistication and elegance to it that um, took this like hard edge, sturdy kind of material, but turned it into something that was really um, elegant and kind of lyrical. He mentioned a little bit about Christine's second piece here that he thought was still quite lovely, but didn't have quite that same um, consistency and sense of resolve is the one up above. I think he was responding to the uh, more narrow color palette, but I'm not sure. I think they're both lovely. Very cool. Um, the first place winner in photography is Gabby Pruitt. He was so excited about this one saying that as a photographer it's such a challenge to figure out how to do something different. Um, and he loved that she took this photograph of Clyde Warren, that's the title of the piece, um, from such a different perspective, sharing it with the viewer in such a different kind of way. Um, he thought that it ticked all of the design boxes, that it had a really great sense of foreground, middle ground, background, that it had um, big shapes, medium shapes, little shapes, um, that it had good visual pathway and movement through the picture plane. And he was just really impressed with this photo. So we're excited for Gabby that she won. I go to Clybourne all the time with my kids and I have never seen it this way. So she did awesome. Um, I wanted to take just a second to talk about this piece by Carla Keese, just to say that she is the acting president for Plano Art Association. So if you had any questions, you could reach out to her and she could give you um, all the information about Plano Art Association and let you know um, details about them. And she's a glass artist. Um, this one is called Fire and Ice. It's 12 inches by 12 inches by eight inches um, and just has this really kind of um, energetic overlapping of the different layers. It's really nice between the, the very cool kind of delicate quality of the ice and then the complexity of the fire. Um, and it almost starts to look like the um, photograph is then using natural elements to mix in, which is a really cool transition. Okay, let's keep going. thought maybe we could chat about this one just for a second since it's so different than some of the other ones that we've looked at. This piece is by David Blow. Um, it's photography and it's called Wooded Vibrations. And I just think it is a cool piece that um, capitalizes on this like mix between the really non-representational and then the moments that are representational. And the thing that I like about this photograph is that it really transcends and almost starts to look like a painting or like that it has colored pencil marks. It's fun the way that he blurs that idea of um, like how things start to pixelate and fall apart and like that through these vibrations, things um, can kind of shimmy or shift for us, which is really beautiful. So let's look at a little bit more and then we're almost to the end of the shows. This one's really fun by Ted Houston. It's called Not for Sissies. Um, and I think it falls in between the um, representational and abstract space. You know, that's kind of was the theme of the juror this year was finding those different places. And this one really skirts that line in between, which is really cool. 
Um, I think for this one, for me, one of my favorite parts about it is that it has this really great complementary blue-orange split that's working, but then he does some really smart things where you'll have like these more yellow kind of oranges that work against the violets. So I love how the complements work. And then that the focal points have these really kind of lovely um, pink moments that really pop. There's so much movement and the brush strokes are really beautiful. Um, so it's fun to see that all of the members make such different kinds of things um, and are touching on the different aspects of art making, which we love. So let's go see the best in show. This will be so fun. Okay, we made it. So Jerry Smith, our um, juror, really loves Sue Killingsworth portrait that's called um, Mistaken Identity. Um, when I talked to him about it this morning, he was saying that he thought, one, obviously because it's so hyper-representational that it takes such a high level of skill, but what he really liked was that it still was so painterly, um, but soft and subtle, and that the artist made these really smart decisions to keep parts of it out of focus, um, to put some parts... Um, that became more about the design. She uses great color with the orange and the blue split. And then these little delicate moments like the hummingbird and the um, barrettes and so forth. So he just was really impressed with the skill and the care and mostly the choices that were made. So unlike the onions that was very painterly, um, this one had that kind of softer, more delicate kind of approach, which he found really lovely. Um, so we can walk through and look at just a couple more that kind of lead us to the end. This piece down here um, is Jean Dillard, who was one of the presidents um, of the Plano Art Association in the past. And I hope that you guys um, enjoyed looking at the show with me today. You can reach out to Plano Art Association and find them on their website um, to learn more about how you might want to become a member and work on making some of this artwork with all of us. Um, all right, we'll see you soon. Thanks, bye. I'm glad to be here. My name's Jerry Smith. I'm the juror for this exhibition. Uh, a little bit of a background. Uh, I have been an artist for practically my whole life since age 13. I've been exhibiting in art shows state and nationally uh, with over about 250 different exhibitions, including some uh, museum shows in Florida and Georgia. So I feel like I'm doing what everybody here in this room is doing, trying to figure out a way to become an artist and to be uh, as successful I can as to whatever level I am. I, I wanna thank everybody for participating in this art show and for contributing their efforts. I know all of you are seeking to become artists or having desire to, to exhibit. And I wanna say it's like an infomercial. You know, some of you all say um, everybody should be able to make art. And I'd say, sure, why not? We all like to eat. Everybody should know how to do some kind of cooking. And I can't say that my omelets are something that's gonna get me on a TV show with Julia Child, but I like to eat, I like to make things, and I know that all of you have a desire to make artwork. However, the big question is, who won the awards and why did that judge pick those things and why wasn't I selected? So let me just talk in general about what makes uh, artwork good or what do people look for when it comes to the overall uh, juring process? Well, well, first of all, you might think about uh, judging the same way that you choose uh, an outfit. You know, you are living artwork, you are sculpture. Uh, and when people choose an outfit, you might fall in love with the material or we might say the artistic media. You might like the feel of the cloth, the weave of the pattern, the the physicality of it. But you also might like the design, the composition, what you might say is the, the way the outfit has been constructed. And you think about things like shapes, large and small, forms, necklines, directional lines, details and accessories. And you fall in love with an outfit or choose it because of what it looks like physically. But you also might think about the emotional quality of an outfit. You might think, well, it gives me a sense of spring or winter or uh, you know, wedding or whatever. We have outfits that have an emotional inheritance to them. And you also might pick an outfit because of its statement. It might have a message or it might belong to a company or a sports team that you're fond of. And so you're promoting something and making a physical statement when you wear that outfit. And so art has all of those qualities. It has the physical, it has the emotional, it has the tactile. And uh, so when it comes to judging artwork, we tend to think about the overall appearance, but the overall appearance is made up of those individual little details that come together to create a whole. 
And uh, as far as like uh, picking artworks, we do have different medias here. So there are four different medias represented. When it comes to photography, uh, you know, the photographer can do many technical things in the dark room. They can do technical things with the developing and the camera. But overall, when we look at a photograph, the main thing that we are confronted with is that a photographer saw something, they chose it, they presented it, and we say, wow. I saw the same thing, and I never saw it that way. I never saw it as art. And so the photographer is giving us their vision. Uh, the artwork that I chose for the photography award is by Gabrielle Pruitt. It's Hyde Park. And what I saw in that photograph is that she saw something that I could have easily walk in, walked by, or I might have been in the location, but she's framed it in such a way that it says, this is not just a presentation of a thing. It is line and shape and color and texture and rhythm and repetition and all of those elements, the formal qualities of artwork. So it's, it's a gorgeous piece in terms of large shapes and small shapes, delicate neon lights versus large structural items, the, the softness of organic trees versus the harshness of geometry. And it's put together in a way that says, wow, somebody saw this and they saw it in a way that creates it into an artistic presence that anybody else would walk by. So thank you, Gabrielle, for your, your amazing photograph. There are other photographs that are great, and I might say, well, they are artistic, they do have design, but maybe they just don't have that little extra vision or they aren't quite to the level of uniqueness. Sometimes we do like artwork that is a unique vision and not just merely the same thing we're accustomed to seeing all the time. Uh, when it came to uh, sculpture, I, I think about sculpture as having the quality of being able to be visited from multiple viewpoints. And so it, if it's not really uh, desirable or aesthetically pleasing from different sides, then it's not really sculpture. I think that's what makes sculpture the, its, its unique quality. Uh, I went ahead and chose the artwork by Christine Miller. Now, I know that she had uh, two works presented, but uh, I chose number 14, uh, the work that seemed to have a little more subtle presence. It wasn't quite definable as a still life, but it was still unique shapes and forms that were reminiscent of something organic. And the material itself is organic, but she didn't hide the fact that it was fi a fiber arts. She didn't hide the the fact that it was weaving, you can look at the work and clearly see how it was constructed first as a flat two-dimensional item, but then she decided to transform it into a three-dimensional entity by shaping it, giving it a unique form. And again, I, I wish I could see the work in person so I can go ahead and view it from multiple viewpoints, but I think that's what makes it a, a strong piece of artwork. The artist had a unique cre uh, vision in terms of how they created it with their own unique idea of forming and modeling. They took materials that were traditional, presented them in a novel, new way. And at the same time, the, the technique, I'm assuming, is very uh, impeccable in terms of the actual physical weaving and construction of the piece. You know, we, we do tend to like sculpture that doesn't fall down or break apart or tip over because it's unbalanced. We tend to like artwork sculpturally because it has an architectural quality to it that pleases the senses as well as functioning in a, in a very, very physical realm. Uh, when it came to the representational artworks, uh, representational meaning that it presents something from reality. And I, I felt that there are a few artworks in the non-representation that were really reminiscent of the landscape. So when we talk about representational, we really mean it has a basis or a reality, even if it's abstracted, that uh, represents the landscape or the portrait or the still life. Uh, the work I selected for the um, work in non -re in representational was Sue Killingsworth. She has a very small, intimate uh, painting of onions. Uh, something that, that is traditional in terms of like a still life. It's a, an, a normal subject, but again, it's presented in a way that uh, becomes art. Now, when it comes to the formal quality of oil painting, we tend to think about the idea that oil painting allows for blending and manipulation of the media, the lushness of the oil and the, uh, the uh, fluidity uh, uh, and glossiness to it. We, we tend to think that painting has its own unique qualities. Watercolor has its own unique quality in terms of transparency and the bleeding and the blending. Uh, acrylic has the ability to be painted in with an impasto manner. So all of the different, different painting medias and including drawing and pastel 
style. They all have their unique way in which they're made. But uh, I looked at the fact that the painting uh, of the onions, the oil painting, was an exquisite work at the best technical point of the media. It represented the media in a high quality way. But yet at the same time, it said, this is a painting. It's merely just splotches of paint. When you get up close and look at it, you can see the individual brush strokes. There's a, a, a minute amount of energy that takes place on a small scale. And then magically, when one steps away from the artwork, it transforms into photographic reality. So it, it gives us the greatest duality of representationalism, but yet at the same time telling us this is a painting made by hand with the hand of the artist visible in the individual brush strokes that one can perceive. It's a gorgeous composition. It has large masses and delicate masses. It has areas of detail and areas of broadness. And not all artwork has to be huge in order to have a monumental appearance. I was really uh, very pleased to see that the, the painting itself overcame any sense of scale. It simply presented itself. It was, since the uh, representational category was the most uh, uh, entered, it was a very time-consuming process to try and determine which one was the, uh, the actual winner. And uh, again, for various reasons, when it comes to physical aesthetics, when it comes to composition and design, when it comes to the technical handling of the media, and maybe even that little spark of creativity, I thought that was the, uh, the, the number one work there. And then lastly, dealing with the non-representational. Non-representational in many ways can be the most difficult thing to try and do. For one thing, how do you know when the darn thing's done? It's just lines and shapes and colors and textures. At least with a portrait, you know it's done when you got all the features on the face. So in many ways, working non-objectively is a, a tougher gig. It, it's like doing a theater uh, spontaneously as opposed to working from a script. And uh, what I see is that uh, the work by um, Keith Miller, uh, working on glass uh, in, in plexiglass, intrigued me the most. Uh, while it wasn't a condition on winning, I was uh, appreciative of the fact that the artist had two works that show that they had a physical direction in which they were creating artwork. They have a personal vision that they were trying to create. They weren't just making things, but they were making something that displayed, this is me and my personal character. I, I look for artwork in which the artist is establishing their own personal vocabulary. Vocabulary could be the marks that the brush makes, it could be the colors that are used, it could be the combination of shapes or rhythms or repetitions. I, I know that the work uh, that uh, he utilizes is more of a spontaneous pouring method, but uh, the, the work uh, number 39, a, a red painting, showed me that there was a little bit of underpainting, some kind of pre-planned design that was placed first and the spontaneity went on top of it and was manipulated. So I appreciate the fact that it wasn't just a, a random act of luck. It was something that the artist manipulated knowing forehand what kind of effects they could create or what were the general concepts that can happen when they work with a specific process. And uh, the work itself, aesthetically, it combines all the great design elements of you know mixing and matching, uh, emphasis and uh, a minority. So it has small details, large masses. It it has thin line, large shapes, organic complicated shapes and simple shapes. It had all these various things that say the outfit the person chose is visually interesting. You know, I myself am wearing just a pair of jeans and a black sweater. It's pretty boring. You start adding the nuances of detail and giving me other combinations of things to look at, and suddenly it's no longer just a single entity, but it's something that can occupy my mind, and I could take the time to look at it and appreciate the many different things that are taking place, both with the media and with the, uh, the visual design. So those were the, uh, the four works I picked for the uh, first place winners in each category of photography, sculpture, representational art, and non-representational. Uh, again, it's a tough decision because it doesn't uh, take into account my knowledge of the artist or what they're trying to accomplish or their years of skill or their years of training. It's simply a matter of looking at art for its face value. And uh, I'll simply state, I'm a judge. There are plenty of other judges out there who have their own opinions. And if uh, 
there's any disagreement about uh, winning or not winning or your participation, I would not take this as, as a personal insult. I simply state it's one person's opinion. Keep looking for somebody else. I'm sure you'll find other opinions you agree with. Uh, I've been rejected from the last seven art shows I've applied for. So, you know, again, there's always that crazy judge out there who just doesn't have the common sense to know how good you really are. But there, there really are truly good works here in the show that I, I've uh, appreciated very much seeing. And then lastly, uh, I uh, didn't realize I was supposed to be promoting a best of show work. I already had picked my uh, four artworks that I thought were the best in each category. And uh, as far as that best of show, I think I have to go back and, and state that I have to consider the formal qualities that I would use to grade artwork. Number one, does it have great design? Is it composed very well? Uh, you could have a very meaningful uh, picture with all kinds of emotional and contentious issues, but if it's not designed, if it's not uh, put together with a great sense of balance and composition, it won't carry its message. And then secondly, we do have to have artwork that has a great subject or a content. And again, for non-representational, that includes the media. We like artwork that has uh, a sense of technique, that regardless of how well it's done you know, or not done, we appreciate technique. I mean, there is a good way to bake a cake and a bad way to bake a cake, and no matter how special the occasion if the cake's burnt, it isn't going to taste good. So I, I do appreciate the technical aspect. I appreciate the uh, qualities of the content. And I also look at the creativity. Is there something that says, wow, this is unique or different or it's special to the moment and that makes it special? All of those things are a gut level intuition. I can't graph it or map it out or assign its scores and determine who is the overall winner. I think an artist simply has to take everything they know about those criteria criteria and qualities and simply say what resonates or what is the obvious logical choice for to something that has the most overwhelming amount of those qualities. <clears throat> and quite frankly, I have to go back to um, the, the representational painter Sue Killingsworth who has number 53, an oil portrait of a young woman with a hummingbird above her head. And uh, as far as like uh, technique, Obviously, the person has mastered qualities of oil paint. They know how to manipulate the brush. She chose a very, very soft killer skewer or blending, uh, a very, very wise choice when it came to doing things like painting the hair. Too often, uh, people try to get caught up in the details of the hair, and with a thick brush, we all look like Raggedy Ann dolls, and I think the soft, delicate approach, particularly with putting the uh, background hair softly out of focus compared to the foreground face was a very, very smart choice. Uh, obviously, when it comes to the composition and design, it is a portrait, but yet it's balanced out between hair tapering down one side of the painting and the hummingbird on the other. And the hummingbird is an unusual choice. It's a creative choice. It makes me wonder, what is the relationship between the object, the bird, and the person? Is there some symbolism or a memory? It leaves me with just a little bit of wonder that makes it just a little bit more creative than just a normal mugshot portrait, no matter how well it's done. And of course, it is a portrait. I'm going to assume it's recognizable to the face, but you know, obviously it has all of the right details. It has the right size. It has the right proportions. You know, the person not only knows how to manipulate and paint with the paintbrush, but they know how to go ahead and correctly draw from real life, from observation. And again, the little bit of the whimsy with the hummingbird. The color choices are nice choices. The uh, uh, colors of the face to show the nuances of uh, you know warm tones and cool tones in the shadow. Uh, it, it is the obvious choice for, as I look around the room, the best work that says this is an artist who has technique and style and creativity, and they also have a sense of a personal aesthetic and vision. I can identify the person as, as an artist who is reaching a high peak or, or level or mastery that I think all of us shoot for, and that's what would make us uh, want to be more like the grand prize winner of this art show, someone who possesses all of those qualities. And again, when it comes to everybody else in the show, prize winner or not, the fact is you created artwork. It's there to last and enjoy. That's so much more meaningful than the things of life that go away or disappear. So I thank everybody for giving me their artwork to see. I'm glad you have the, uh, the enjoyment and the creativity to go ahead and continue making things like this. And I encourage everybody to keep on pursuing your craft to the highest level you can. Thank you very much for letting me uh, jury the show.